Matthew 28, familiar Easter story, and we will read first ten verses. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said to them. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Today, of course, is Easter, a glorious day for the Church of Christ, a glorious day for all believers, and indeed a glorious day for the world. We have hope because we have a risen Savior. I want to start, children, by asking you to look at this cross that we have here in the church. What does that cross remind you of? Ask yourself, what does that remind you of? Certainly it reminds you of the crucifixion because Christ was crucified on a cross and perhaps one about that size. Certainly reminds you of that. Does it remind you of Easter, this cross? You think it does? Ask yourself, does this cross, an empty cross, remind you of Easter? Let me give you a hint how that might be. You know, there are a lot of crosses that we see that have an image or a figure of Christ on them. Those are called a crucifix. This cross doesn't have that. This cross is empty. And I'd like to suggest to you that maybe that's how it reminds us of Easter. I think most crosses in Christian churches are like this. They are empty. Because Christ is no longer on the cross. He has risen. He's in heaven and now lives in our hearts and in the hearts of his children. And I think that's why this cross can remind us of Easter, because it is empty. And maybe that's why we have it here in this church. We have a risen Savior. You know, the resurrection is one of the most important Important parts of God's salvation plan. Indeed, I think it is one of the essential parts of God's salvation plan. Christ conquered death, overcame the grave, and we serve a risen Savior. He lives. That's what we can say on Easter. That is our comfort. That's why we can have comfort, because we serve a risen Savior. And that's why we can answer Lord's Day 1 of our Heidelberg Catechism 
the way we do. Let's take a look at that now. Lord's Day 1 of the Heidelberg Catechism. This is perhaps the most familiar of all of the questions and answers of the Heidelberg Catechism. I dare say that most of you who are my age and older have probably committed this to memory. On Friday night, we heard the um, Dort College Choir sing, and they have Lord's Day 1 in song, in verse. Some of you were there, I think, and heard that, and it's beautiful. Let's read the question. I'll read the question, and you can read the answer. Lord's Day 1. What is your only comfort in life and in death? like to talk to you about that just for a few minutes this morning. The theme of the message, as you noticed from the bulletin, is Easter, a call to personal commitment. Personal commitment. And there are two points to this. My and comfort. My and comfort. And my is the first part. The personal part. When we say my comfort, we're talking about a personal comfort. I counted in this answer that there are 12 times that personal words are used, such as me or my or I, in this answer to to Lord's Day 1. Might be a coincidence, of course. I think it's um, obvious that there were 12 apostles, 12 disciples. Many people say that's why we have 12 members on a jury. And 12 is the number of organized religion in this world as it's used symbolically in the Bible. Kind of interesting that there happen to be 12 personal words used in this answer in the Heidelberg Catechism. Reverend um, Herman Huxema, in his book on the Heidelberg Catechism, or his exposition on the Heidelberg Catechism, says that the Heidelberg Catechism is experientially subjective. That is, that it is specific and personal, based on what is experienced in the consciousness of the Christian in this world. The consciousness of the Christian. That's personal. When we say... My comfort, notice that my is a possessive word. When we say something is mine, we mean that it belongs to me. No one else has the claim that I do when I say that something is mine. We say that often about personal possessions. We say that a lot. It's mine or that's my car, or that's my house. That means that we have a particular relationship with that object, that possession, when we say that's mine. Same is true with interpersonal relationships, those relationships we have between persons. To some of you, you know, the person ahead of you is... Mr. Kikukuk or Mrs. Kaminga or Mrs. Carter or Mr. Nagel. To others, that same person is my dad or my mom. And that means a whole lot more, of course. When you say that my, that brings to mind thoughts of love, shared times, 
mended bicycles and fixed sores and all of those kinds of things. That my, my dad or my mom is personal. Or some of you would say, well, look at that person ahead of me, that man or that lady, Mr. Glass or Mrs. Hahn or something like that. For others of you, you would say, that's my husband or my wife or some other relationship that is personal to you. And that my, when you use it that way, calls to mind those years of giving to the other, years of happiness and joy, sacrifice and sorrow, helping and holding, care and concern, embarrassment and intimacy, sadness and silliness, laughter and love, and all those other emotions that you can think of when you say, that's my dad or my husband or my child. That's what we should think of, I submit to you, when we say, my comfort. My comfort is that I am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Do we? Do we think of that? Do we think of those personal emotions when we think of our Lord and Savior? If we don't, I suggest to you it's only because we don't know him well enough. Let's make him personal, our risen Savior. There are at least, you know, two examples in the Bible of that kind of personal relationship um, that we should emulate, that we should have. The first is uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Think of the personal relationship that she had to Jesus. Indeed, it was a blessed relationship that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had. We often think, you know, of the Roman Catholics, um, that they put Mary on too high of a pedestal. But it's biblical that she um, was blessed. You remember in Luke 1, verse 41 and 42, the Bible says, And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women. She was talking about Mary. That blessed relationship continued, and it was a personal one that she had with our Savior. In Luke 2, verse 19, we read, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. How often do we ponder the things of God in our heart? Experience them personally. How often do we do that? The second example of a personal relationship is from another Mary who had been healed by Christ and had followed him through life and death. And we find that um, in the Bible, and you can sense that personal relationship that this Mary had when we read in John 20, verse 15 and 16, Mary was at the tomb. This was on resurrection Easter morning. She was at the graveside, and she saw this stranger. And she said to this stranger, Sir... If you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And then we read that Jesus said to her, Mary. One word, Mary. That's the kind of personal relationship that you and I should have, that you and I need, so that when He says your name, you know him personally. And then you can say, that's my comfort, and know it, so that you have experienced it in your consciousness. 
It's mine, my comfort, personally. And I think that's what the Heidelberg Catechism is getting at here when they say, what is your comfort in life and in death? My comfort, that personal relationship that we experience in our consciousness. The second part of it is, the second point, is comfort. My comfort is that he has provided me salvation. The Heidelberg Catechism says it this way, he has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. On Easter, of course, we remember an important part of that salvation, the resurrection. He arose, or he rose, as it says in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And that, incidentally, is an active word. It's not passive. It's not something that happens to you when you arise. It's something you do. You know, when you get out of bed in the morning, it's something you do. You rise. It requires action. It requires doing on your part. And so it was with Jesus. You know, I had this picture when I was a child of the tomb, large tomb, where they put Christ. This picture of Easter. And it had this huge rock in front of it. And the angels had to come down and roll away that huge rock. And I had this picture that it almost required angels to do it because it was so large. And that the reason that they did it was to roll it away so that you could see the entrance and that would therefore permit Jesus to get out. Is that accurate? Do you think that's what happened on Easter Sunday? Oh, no. We didn't need the angels for that. The angels were there to show that the grave was empty, that he had already arisen. It was a witness to the watching world that the tomb was empty, that Christ had risen and that he had done it on his own. He didn't need the angels' help for that. He had conquered the grave. And he now lives in heaven. That's comfort. That's what he gave to me. That personal salvation on this Easter day. Ask yourself this. What is the nature of this comfort? The Heidelberg Catechism says that in life and Death, we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. What does that mean? You know, it's easy to say that our comfort in death is to belong to God. That's what we all want, isn't it? That when we die, we will belong to God. That's pretty easy to say. When I die, I certainly want to belong to God. But we also must say, this is our comfort in life, according to the Heidelberg Catechism. We have a lot of good in life, don't we? You know, there are some unpleasant things, but on the whole, most of us think that we have it pretty good. Life is pretty good. And I think we usually tend to put the things of life in two piles. A lot of evil and suffering, certainly put that in one pile, but we have a lot to be thankful for, we think, a lot of things, and we usually put those on the other pile. And sometimes um, we seem to think that there are a lot of things in life, a lot of possessions and other things that we have that make life worth living, it seems. Why do we have to say then, in this answer to the Heidelberg Catechism, that this is our only comfort in life. The Heidelberg Catechism, I submit, teaches to you, to us here, that life and death are both evils. They're spoken of here in the same phrase. They're in the same class. 
And I submit to you it's because life is also death. That life ends in death and offers us no real comfort. We need, it's taught here, the same comfort against both life and death. And that is that we belong to God, to our faithful Savior. We need the comfort that overcomes the evil not only of death, but also of life. That we belong to our faithful Savior must be our answer in all of our circumstances. That must be our comfort in all of our circumstances. When everything goes against you in life, that's got to be your answer. You know, when there is a recession or a depression, as many of you can remember, when you may have to or have walked the streets to find a job, to provide for your family, when you use up all of your savings, when you lose your house and have to live on welfare, what is your only comfort? That soon the evil days are going to be over and that prosperity is coming? Oh, no. Your only comfort is that you belong to Christ. Or, if sickness attacks your body, day after day, week after week, month after month, you travel the way of suffering, what is your comfort? That there are specialists, that there are doctors who can alleviate your suffering, or that you can look forward perhaps to recovery at some unknown time in the future? Oh, no. Your only comfort is that you belong to Christ. Or if death or serious illness enters your home and strikes or takes away a dear child, tearing it from your heart, then know well and emphatically that your comfort is that you belong to Christ. You belong to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. How is this possible? How do we know that it's so? The Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 3 says, You are Christ, and Christ is God's. You are Christ, and Christ is God's. And in Romans 8, we read, in the last verses, Know in all these things, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's our comfort. There's one word that uh, we've overlooked in this answer. The question asks, what is your only comfort? The answer is, my only comfort is that I am not my own. There is one salvation, and that is our only comfort. Reverend Hooksema, in his book, says this comfort is exclusive and sufficient. One who has this comfort needs no other. We don't rely on other things. 
Comfort is not in things, not in a position in the world or in the church. There's no comfort in being the president of the United States or the president of the seminary. There's no comfort in possessions or material things. You soon find out you never have enough. They are soon gone and fade away, and they are no longer important. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God. There is one God and one Savior. That's why the Catechism says, What is your only comfort? It doesn't say, What is your great comfort? Or what is your chief comfort? It says, what is your only comfort? And the complete answer would be, my only comfort is that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our comfort on this Easter. Christ arose. He provided for our salvation and he lives. Just as you know, a P.S. is the last line on a letter. So my comfort, that personal salvation, that P.S. is the bottom line, that I am not my own but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's my comfort and your comfort. Personal salvation from a risen Savior. Think of that P.S. as you view this empty cross on Easter Sunday. Personal salvation. My comfort. And then... You can say, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fears are gone. Because I know who holds the future, life is worth the living just because he lives. Let's pray to God that he lives in your heart in mind and gives us that comfort. Our God and our Father, we serve a risen Savior. Help us to remember that. Help us to put our trust in you so that we can say that my comfort is that I serve a living Savior. Help us to say with Paul that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. In Christ's name we pray.